Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This will be the start of a new story called Remnants Venomous Spider. All credit to the author, their information can be found in the description below, as well as a link to the story if you would like to read along. This will be chapter 1 to 2. Also, don't forget to smash that like button and comment to help with the algorithm. It's much appreciated. Now let's get into the story. Near the border of the land of fire and the land of sound, formerly known as the land of rice, was the Valley of the End. It was here that the Shodame Hokage, Hashirama Senju, and Madara Uchiha had their final clash, with the valley having been formed from the destructive power of Madara controlling the Kyubi no Yoko, and Hashirama using his famed Mokutan and top transformed Buddha. The battle ended with Hashirama being victorious and Madara being killed, while the Kyubi was sealed away into Hashirama's wife, Mito Uzumaki. Statues of Hashirama and Madara were created at the site of their battle, built on opposite sides of the newly formed waterfall and river that divided the valley, with Hashirama's statue on the side of the land of fire and Madara's on the opposite, signifying his defection from Kanoha. Now, after decades since their battle, another fight was being fought within the Valley of the End, with many similarities between Hashirama and Madara's own clash. The battle was fought by former teammates and friends, Naruto Uzumaki and Sasuke Uchiha. The reason for the battle was Sasuke's departure from Kanoha to join the rogue snake Sanin, Orochimaru, to gain the power he needed to kill his brother, Itachi. Naruto, being part of the retrieval team sent to bring Sasuke back, had promised their teammate Sakura that he'd bring Sasuke back, no matter what. Both boys fought with everything they had until Naruto accessed the Kyubi's chakra within him, entering the first stage of his biju cloak, covering him in a fox-shaped cloak of red chakra, while Sasuke entered the second stage gaining large hand-like webbed wings on his back. The battle soon reached its end when Naruto and Sasuke used their strongest attacks, the Rasengan and Chidori, against each other, resulting in Naruto scratching Sasuke's forehead protector and Sasuke stabbing his Chidori into his chest before punching Naruto. Sasuke landed on the ground, panting heavily, exhausted and low on chakra from the fight. Looking, the Uchiha saw Naruto lying on the edge of the river, unconscious. Seeing Naruto unconscious, Sasuke knew he could easily kill him right now, allowing him to unlock the Mangekyo Sharingan, gain the same eyes as Itachi, and be able to kill him. But that would also make him no different than Itachi, along with doing exactly what his brother wanted. And Sasuke was done letting Itachi decide his actions. Sasuke's eyes widened when he saw Naruto's body falling into the river. Mentally cursing, Sasuke ran to grab Naruto before he fell in, refusing to let him die because of his actions, refusing to be like Itachi. Sasuke quickly dropped down and just managed to grab him by the collar of his jacket. Tisk, even when I'm trying to leave, I'm still stuck pulling your dead weight, Sasuke thought, gritting his teeth to try and pull Naruto out of the water. Unfortunately, Sasuke soon felt his grip slipping, both from being exhausted from their fight and the rushing water fighting against him. Before Sasuke could react, he lost his grip on Naruto's collar, and Naruto's body immediately was carried away by the current. Damn it, thought Sasuke unable to do anything but watch as Naruto vanished beneath the water. Slamming his fist on the river's surface, Sasuke cursed Naruto for trying to bring him back, leading to this. Knowing that Naruto was going to drown, Sasuke could only look at his reflection in the water as his Sharingan transformed to the next stage. Standing up, Sasuke took off his headband before tossing it into the river as well, then turned around and continued towards the land of sound. Knowing he couldn't stay here any longer or risk someone else from Kanoha showing up to force him back. Considering how much the Hokage favored Naruto, he'd be lucky if life imprisonment was all he got. After what happened, knowing he'd be blamed for Naruto's death. A few moments after Sasuke left the valley, Kakashi Hataki arrived with his Ninkin summoned Paken, both trying to find any sign of Naruto or Sasuke. Paken found Sasuke's sent heading towards the Land of Sound, with Naruto's ending at the riverbank. Worried about what this could mean, Kakashi followed the river hoping to find Naruto, only to find no sign of his student. Knowing if he hadn't found Naruto, or any sign of him, Kakashi could only accept that Naruto likely wouldn't be found at all. With his head hung in shame and sadness, Kakashi began heading back to Kanoha to inform the Hokage of what happened. Unknown to Kakashi and Sasuke, Naruto survived falling into the water and being carried out to sea, thanks to the QB using its chakra to ensure his lungs weren't filled with water and warding off any aquatic predators. Naruto remained floating in the middle of the sea until eventually, he was found. Unfortunately, before that could happen, Naruto's unconscious body was carried towards a massive wall of mist that stretched out for miles, known simply as the mist, 
a barrier that stretched all around the elemental nations, separating them from the rest of the world. No one knows where the mist came from, only that it's existed for as long as anyone could remember. Many people have tried passing through the mist to find out what rests on the other side, only for all who pass through to never return and are never heard from again, leading many people to wonder if they made it to the other side or not, if they remain trapped within the mist, or if they simply died after entering. Before long, Naruto's body passed through the mist, and not a moment later, Naruto's eyes snapped open as he released a silent scream of pure agony, feeling like his body was tearing itself apart while also trying to keep itself together. Unknown to Naruto, this was the result of passing through the mist, that anyone with chakra would have it violently ripped out of them, with Naruto now experiencing that very feeling. Mindscape. Damn you, boy. This is your fault. You and your damn obsession with the Uchiha. Kyuubi growled as it flooded Naruto's body with more and more of its chakra in an attempt to keep his chakra network intact, while around the fox, the mindscape was shaking and falling apart. Though the more the Kyuubi repaired Naruto's network, the more the mist tried tearing it apart, showing that whatever beings had created the mist, they made sure no one would survive passing through. I swear if we survive this, I'm going to kill you myself, thought Kyuubi, angry that it was stuck in this situation because the brat couldn't just kill the damn Uchiha, and now wasn't only in danger of drowning but also whatever awaited them on the other side of the mist. However, Kyuubi's attention then turned to a bright light that suddenly appeared before it, growing brighter with each passing moment. While the shaking began settling down, to Kyuubi's shock, it saw a figure appear from the light. That's impossible, Kyuubi whispered in shock at who it saw. It was a young man with dark-colored eyes, short spiky brown hair, two locks of which were wrapped in bandages, framing either side of his face, while possessing stern facial features. His attire consisted of bandages around his forehead, a light-colored kimono with magatama adorned around the collar, held closed by a dark-colored sash, and underneath, he wore a black full-body suit. What shocked Kyuubi wasn't just the figure's appearance, but that it knew who it was. Azura, said Kyuubi in disbelief at seeing the younger son of its creator, the Sage of the Six Paths, it's nice to see you again, Kurama, Azura Atsutsuki said, smiling at his younger sibling, regardless of their species, as they had the same father. How, how are you here? Kurama asked, with Azura looking around the still-shaking mindscape, while frowning. I'll tell you later. For now, I need your help to make sure Naruto survives this, with his chakra intact, Azura said. Kurama, remembering what was happening right now, nodded before resuming channeling its chakra through Naruto's chakra network to repair it. Azura knelt down and placed his right hand on the ground, causing a white sun mark to appear on his palm. All around them, the shaking stopped entirely, while the mindscape began repairing itself. After a few moments, both Azura and Kurama sensed that Naruto's chakra network was fully repaired and not in danger of being destroyed or ripped away again, with him still able to use chakra without many difficulties. With the danger out of the way, Kurama looked at Azura, now wanting to get some answers. Azura, how are you here? Kurama asked, confused at seeing the youngest of its father's biological sons in the brat's mindscape. It's because Naruto is my transmigrant, having inherited my chakra and will, just as Hashirama did before him, Azura revealed, shocking Kurama to hear that this brat had inherited Azura's chakra. Then, to Kurama's further shock, Azura fell on his hands and knees, then bowed to it. Kurama, I am truly sorry for what happened to you and the Biju, for having been caught in mine and Indra's feud, to be sealed away like this. And I know I have no right asking this, but please, I ask that you watch over and guide my last descendant, Azura requested, with Kurama looking down at its creator's son. Stand up, the old man's son shouldn't bow to anyone, except him. And yes, I'll watch out for the boy, Kurama said, with Azura smiling in gratitude, before noticing his body beginning to disperse, showing he would be returning to the afterlife. Thank you, Kurama, and farewell, Azura said, placing his hand on the ground once more, as he passed on his blessed mark to Naruto, to help him along his journey. With that, Azura faded away from Naruto's mindscape, while Kurama laid down, looking at the spot where its sibling once stood. You got lucky, brat, very lucky, Kurama muttered. It will honor Azura's request to watch out for the boy, but that didn't mean they'll be friends. If Naruto wanted to earn Kurama's respect, he'll have to prove it through his actions. For now, Kurama will ensure that Naruto doesn't drown or get eaten by anything, until he gets to land. Later real world. Opening his eyes, Naruto blinked a few times before raising a hand to his face to shield his eyes from the sun. Sitting up, Naruto looked around in confusion at where he was, 
only seeing he was in a place with a lot of snow. Standing up, Naruto winced as he felt a sudden soreness in his chest. Looking, Naruto frowned when he saw a hole in his jacket and shirt, along with what looked like a faint fist-sized scar in his lower chest. Naruto then noticed a white circle on his right palm, which only confused him more. What is this and where am I? Naruto wondered, while looking around again. Deciding to just start walking away from where he was, Naruto hoped he'd be able to find some place that can show him where he is. So, Naruto walked through the tundra for what he guessed would be around 20 or 30 minutes, and so far, hasn't seen any sign of civilization or anyone else. Though just before Naruto gave up and tried going in a different direction, he spotted what looked like a mine not far from where he was, much to his relief. Hopefully, someone there can tell me where I am, thought Naruto as he began heading towards the mine. Unfortunately, it seemed Naruto's luck wasn't the best, as before he could reach the mine, he was suddenly surrounded by people wearing strange armor and pointing even stranger metal objects at him, the latter of which Naruto could only guess were weapons, but none he had ever seen before. Hold it right there, animal. One of the people said, glaring at him, with Naruto frowning at being called an animal and feeling the hostility. Look, I'm looking for an... Naruto was cut off as he grunted in pain when he felt one of the people slam their weapon into the back of his head. Shut it, freak. Now start moving, or else. The person said, Naruto rubbing his head, now getting angry at being attacked for no reason. All right, I'll just Leah, said Naruto, only to then be forced to his knees by the same person who hit him, kicking him in the back of his legs. You aren't going anywhere, Faunus. Now either get moving or die, sneered the person, pressing their weapon to Naruto's head. Knowing he didn't have a choice in the matter, Naruto simply got up and began moving where the assailants were forcing him to go. All the while, he wondered a few things, with one of them being, what the hell was a faunus? Naruto saw that they were leading him to the mine he had seen before, making him regret going there to begin with. Sir, we found an animal out in the tundra. One of the people said to someone who Naruto guessed was in charge. One of ours. Questioned the boss. No, he's not marked or collared. Probably just a freak that got lost, replied the person who Naruto really wanted to deck in the face. Then put the stupid animal with the rest of them, not like anyone will care if one goes missing. The boss said before he and the others laughed, while Naruto was forced into the mine. Inside the mine, Naruto only became angrier when he saw that the workers were chained up and forced to mine strange glowing colored rocks. Though what confused Naruto was that they all had animal parts, like ears, antlers, horns, scales, even tails. He also saw a few giving him looks of pity, making Naruto realize that these definitely weren't nice people. He also saw a white snowflake logo on some pieces of equipment and the letters SDC, showing this was some large operation rather than just a single mine. Naruto's anger only continued growing as he had chains forced onto his wrists, ankles, and a collar put on his neck. It didn't help that the bastards were smirking smugly or cruelly at him, as if they enjoyed chaining him up like an animal. I swear, if I ever get the chance, I'm going to enjoy tearing these bastards apart limb from limb, Naruto thought, while stopping himself from glaring at them, doubting that it helped his situation. He then had a pickaxe forced into his hands and was ordered to start digging, with Naruto doing so reluctantly, after resisting the urge to slam the pick into the bastards' heads. What's your name, kid? Asked one of the workers, really a slave, with goat horns. Naruto Uzumaki, Naruto replied grunting as he swung the pickaxe. Well, I'm sorry this happened to you, Naruto Uzumaki. You got any family? The worker asked, with Naruto frowning at the question. I don't know, Naruto answered, with the worker looking at him with a raised brow. Well, where are you from? Questioned the worker, Naruto's frown deepening as he started to get worried. I don't know, said Naruto, as he tried remembering something, anything, besides his name, only to come up empty. What do you remember last? The worker asked, now really pitying the kid if he couldn't remember anything. Nothing, Naruto said. After a few moments, now worried and freaking out, he couldn't remember anything. Time skipped two months. Two months had passed since Naruto had been captured and forced into what he learned was a dust mine, owned by the Shinee Dust Company. And since then, his hatred for the guards had only grown. They seemed to take a special enjoyment in tormenting him, using any reason possible to taunt him or push him around trying to get Naruto to retaliate, so they could punish him. The punishment ranged from simply beating him into unconsciousness to even using a whip with fire dust and burning his back. What made it worse was when they found out about his healing factor, 
which made them only beat him worse, after seeing he wouldn't die so easily. But it wasn't just Naruto they tormented. He was also forced to watch as the other Faunus were pushed around as well. Sometimes he was forced to watch as some were taken away. Sometimes they came back, and other times they didn't. When Naruto tried asking the other workers what happened to them, their expressions alone told Naruto that he really didn't want to know. Though with each pain and torture inflicted on him, Naruto's anger and hatred grew, and he swore that when he finally escaped, he was going to kill every last one of those guards. Along with getting revenge against the entire Shni Dust Company for what they were doing to the Faunus. Today was October 10th, and unknown to Naruto, his 13th birthday. It was the same as it had been for the past two months, mining as much dust as they could, and if they didn't get enough, they'd be forced to go hungry that night and mine twice as much the next day. Hey, Fox Freak! Suppressing his scowl at hearing this and knowing the bastard meant him, Naruto turned and saw two guards smirking at him. Let's go, one of them said, grabbing Naruto's chains and forcing him to follow them. Just wait, assholes, one day, I'm going to make you pay, Naruto thought grunting in pain when the guard behind him hit him with his gun. Soon they arrived at a room where he saw some other workers, along with the boss, all of whom looked eager about something and had a cruel look in their eyes. The reason became obvious when Naruto caught sight of a branding iron, shaped like the SDC logo, the boss was carrying, making him realize what was about to happen. Immediately, Naruto tried making a break for it, only for one of the guards to smack him across the face with their gun. Where do you think you're going, animal? The fun's just about to start, said the guard wickedly, as Naruto was pushed down onto his knees and his head forced up, as the boss smirked evilly and held the iron over a fire, making it glow red hot. Try to hold still, animal, otherwise we'll just have to keep doing it until I get it right. So on second thought, move all you want, said the boss, moving close to Naruto and holding the iron above his face. These sadistic, psychotic bastards, they actually brand us. Naruto thought as his anger reached an all-time high, which also resulted in him accessing something once again. Suddenly, the guards that were holding Naruto cried out in pain as bubbling red energy shot out of Naruto's body, burning them. Before anyone else could react, Naruto's head shot up, showing his now crimson slitted eyes, elongated canines, and jagged whisker marks. Roaring, Naruto tackled the boss to the ground, while tearing the iron out of his hand. Smiling sadistically, Naruto then slammed the red-hot iron straight into the boss's face, relishing in his screams of agony before his screams were silenced. As Naruto lifted the iron up and slammed it straight into his throat, crushing it. Kill the freak! One of the guards shouted, as they aimed their weapons at Naruto, only for the blonde to vanish in a burst of speed, reappearing behind the guards before swinging the chains still attached to his wrists, wrapping them around two guards' necks. Swinging the guards around, Naruto knocked down the remaining guards before pulling the two being choked close and snapped their necks. Roaring again, Naruto grabbed the collar around his neck and ripped it off. He then crashed through a wall and began tearing apart any guards he saw or that got in his way. All while he still had enough sense to break the chains of the other Faunus, who were shocked at what was happening, before quickly grabbing any weapons from the fallen guards and began fighting back or escaping while they could. Seeing this, Naruto soon made his own escape vanishing in a blur of speed as he ran as far from the mine as possible. He didn't know how long he was running, only that when he finally stopped, Naruto saw he was now in a dark forest. What the hell was that? Naruto thought, panting in confusion and exhaustion, wondering what that red energy was that helped him escape. He didn't think it was this aura stuff he's heard about, as from what he's heard, you needed someone to unlock it. And as far as Naruto knew, his aura hasn't been unlocked. Whatever it was, I'm thankful I have it, thought Naruto, knowing without that strange energy, he likely would have been branded, and possibly even killed. Unfortunately, before Naruto could take a moment to rest, he tensed up when he heard a clicking sound. My Hero Academia OST. You say run? Looking, Naruto gulped and stepped back when he saw a massive black spider, with white bone plating along its legs, back, and a bone mask on its face, with six glowing red-yellow eyes. Naruto knew this must be a creature of grim, and from the size of it, it must be a powerful one. Crap whoa, Naruto thought, jumping back when the spider grim lunged at him. Use the chains. Naruto immediately turned around at the sudden voice, but didn't see anything or anyone else. What the? Jump and flip now. Acting on instinct, Naruto immediately jumped into the air, flipping over the grim that just barely missed biting him. Use the chains while it's distracted. 
Deciding to just listen to the voice, Naruto swung the chains around his wrists, wrapping them around one of the spider's legs, pulling it off balance. Now jump up and drop kick it in the head. Nodding, Naruto jumped up and slammed his feet into the spider's head, dazing it. Now wrap the chains around its neck and kill it. Nodding again, Naruto was about to do just that. Unfortunately, the spider was able to regain its bearings before opening its mouth and shot a glob of webbing at Naruto's arm. This threw Naruto back, while his arm became pinned to a tree. Crap! Naruto thought, struggling to free his arm as the spider charged towards him. Don't panic, wait until it's close and then flip over, so it crashes into the tree. Hearing the voice's instructions, Naruto willed himself to calm down while preparing for the right moment as the spider grew closer. Do it now! Immediately, Naruto flipped up and over the spider as it smashed through the tree, freeing Naruto's arm from the webbing. However, this also resulted in Naruto landing on top of the spider and beginning to ride it. Wrap one of the chains around its neck to hold on, while winding the other one around your hand, and start attacking until it goes down. Doing so, Naruto swung the chain under the spider's neck while grabbing the other end, and he wrapped the second chain around his fist. Once done, Naruto began punching the spider in the head repeatedly, trying to hold on as the grim crashed into trees and rocks in an effort to throw him off. Eventually, Naruto's attacks made the spider's legs give out, and it slid across the forest floor, throwing Naruto off its back and rolling across the ground until he stopped at the edge of a pit filled with black goo. Groaning, Naruto got up and looked at the spider, seeing that it wasn't getting up but was still alive. Now, kill it before it can attack again. Nodding, Naruto began approaching the spider slowly to finish it off, still wary of it suddenly attacking again. And he was right. As soon as he got close, the spider immediately jumped and tackled Naruto straight into the pit of goo, intent on taking him down with it. Falling into the pit, Naruto gasped as the spider grabbed hold of him, and suddenly, they began being thrashed around by an unseen force. Naruto could only watch as the spider began dissolving into black goo, but instead of merging with the surrounding goo, it attached itself to Naruto and started covering him in what looked like a suit. Panicking at what was going on, Naruto tried to get the suit off but found he could hardly even move. The goo also began seeping into Naruto's wounds, merging with his blood as it continued to form around him. Soon, Naruto was covered in a jet black suit with a white spider symbol forming on the front and back, and white squares on the back of his hands. The suit then spread up Naruto's neck and head, covering his face before two large white, jagged lenses formed over his eyes. It didn't stop there. Naruto's body began growing and bulking up, while the suit's mask split open, revealing two rows of razor-sharp teeth and a long tongue. Meanwhile, outside the pit, the entire forest had suddenly fallen silent, with no animals or noise making a sound. Then, without warning, a clawed black hand shot out of the pit and grabbed onto the ledge, pulling itself out of the pit and revealing the being that Naruto and the grim spider had become. Once it had pulled itself out of the pit, the being threw its head back and roared, sending all animals scattering away from it. The being then took off running, acting on its basic grim instincts and began searching for the highest source of negative emotions, finding it in a town close to the flying city of Atlas. Time skipped two weeks. Two weeks have passed since the incident at one of the dust mines, owned by the Schnee Dust Company. Eyewitnesses claim the incident started when the guards at the mine took a young Faunus boy and attempted to brand him with the SDC logo, resulting in what many of the escaped Faunus workers claimed was the boy acting like a grim, attacking all the workers, yet sparing his fellow Faunus and in fact, freeing them from their chains. It is also claimed that the boy was covered in a shroud of red aura that burned anything it touched. When questioned by the accusation of mistreatment and abuse of the Faunus workers, Jacques Schnee, CEO of the Schnee Dust Company, had this to say. These horrid accusations are clearly nothing but lies, made up to slander the Schnee Dust Company's good name. I have personally seen to it that all my workers, both human and Faunus, are treated equally, with there having been no chains or this so-called branding. The only shame is the loss of life for the workers, of what can only be an attack by those terrorists, the White Fang. Rest assured, I have ensured all workers have been pardoned of these false accusations of mistreatment, and those who made them shall be properly disciplined before being returned to work. Meanwhile, within a bar in Atlas, a cloaked figure watched the news report that was being aired in all the kingdoms and menagerie, clenching their fists in anger when Jacques Schnee appeared and gave all those bullcrap lies that any rational and morally sane person could see through. They knew that this would only sour relationships with the other kingdoms, especially menagerie, 
with the White Fang being called terrorists. Not that they were complaining, but it still pissed them off to hear how those bastards were getting away with everything they did, while the Faunus were likely recaptured and would be punished, and all just for wanting their freedom back. The cloaked person's anger rose to the point that the glass they were holding shattered in their hand, but they didn't care as they stood up. Placing some lean on the counter for the drink, along with a tip for the broken glass, the stranger exited the bar. All right, if no one else will punish those bastards for what they did, the stranger thought, entering an alley as their form began changing and growing. Then we will, said the stranger as their voice became deeper and more sinister. Later, after the incident at the mine and giving his response to it, Jacques knew he needed to do something to ensure the SDC didn't lose face in the public eye. To this end, he hosted a public party at the SDC headquarters, welcoming anyone to attend to create a more positive light for the company. He also ensured all workers from the incident showed up to demonstrate that despite what happened, they would remain tall and strong. The event was broadcast live to the rest of the kingdoms, so all of Remnant could see that the SDC company was fair and kind. However, he also made sure there was security for the event, just in case anyone thought to crash it. Hundreds of people had attended the event, though most of them who knew what Jacques Schnee was really like, knew it was all just a publicity stunt to make himself look better. Meanwhile, unknown to all the guests, they were being watched as a pair of eyes looked down at them from a nearby rooftop. The person narrowed their eyes before gaining a wicked grin, showing off razor-sharp teeth when they saw all the workers from the mine gathered together in their own little group. Perfect, the person thought, knowing that'll make it much easier than having to track them all down. The party continued for a few more moments, with everyone either mingling with each other or enjoying the catering. Then, without any warning, it happened. A loud bestial roar echoed throughout the area, freaking everyone out when suddenly a large black blur smashed into the ground. The sight of a nearly six-foot-tall, hulking black behemoth with a white spider symbol on its chest and back, white squares on the back of its hands, sharp claws on the fingers, large jagged white eyes, and a mouth full of shark-like teeth. The sight of the creature made everyone scream in fear and panic. Grim. This caused everyone to begin running around in a panic to escape the Grim, while all the Atlesian knights and soldiers began opening fire on the Grim. The being merely roared before leaping into the air and landing on an Atlesian knight, tearing it apart before shooting a web from their hand that attached to a soldier. The soldier was then pulled towards the being and clotheslined as the being flipped over more shots, grabbing two more soldiers and tossing them into the distance. Tearing a lamp post out of the ground, the being used it as a bat and swung it at a group of knights, knocking the upper part of their bodies off. It then threw the post at the remaining soldiers, knocking them to the ground. The being then roared before turning its attention back to the workers, who tried escaping, only for the being to launch a web at them, tying them up. You aren't going anywhere, said the being, shocking everyone at hearing a supposed grim speak. The being walked up to the cowering workers before grabbing one and lifting him into the air. You aren't going anywhere until you confess the truth of what happened in that mine. The being growled. What are you talking about? We didn't do, eh ah? The worker screamed when the being roared in his face, with its jaws looking ready to bite down on his head. Confess or suffer, said the being, slamming the worker onto the ground, eliciting another cry of pain. All right, all right. It's true. The faunus were chained up, we did beat them, and we did brand them. The man screamed loudly for all to hear, while all the remaining guests gasped in shock at hearing this. And what about the boy who helped the Faunus escape? demanded the being. We just found him out in the tundra and forced him to work in the mine. He went on a rampage after we tried branding him, said the worker, crying in fear, with trails of tears and snot running down his face. Something that made the man look all the more pathetic, yet also amused the being. Back in the mine, they acted all high and mighty because they were armed with weapons while the Faunus were chained, giving them all the illusion of power. But once that illusion has been broken, like back in the mine and now, they have shown what they really are. Nothing but pathetic pieces of sniveling meat that the world is better off without. And why did you force him into the mine? The being said, slamming its foot on the man's chest. Because we didn't think anyone would care about some stupid lost animal, cried the man, with the being grinning before turning to the guests. There you have it, folks. The truth that Jacques Schnee wanted to keep buried. And now the whole world knows the truth, said the being, looking directly at a camera, as everything was still being broadcasted to the other kingdoms. You'll let us go now, right? The worker asked fearfully, only to pale when the being grinned at him menacingly. The man didn't even have time to scream before the being lifted him up, 
before biting down on his head, tearing it off, much to everyone's horror as the guests either began running again or started to puke at the sight. The being then turned to the other workers. The being then created two whips in its hands before striking them across two workers' throats, slicing them open before wrapping both whips around a third worker's neck before having them tear through his neck. The fourth worker, the being once again bit his head off before turning its attention to the last worker, who was cowering in utter fear. The being grabbed the man by his throat and walked over to a camera before picking it up while dropping the worker on the ground and stepping on his head. To everyone in the four kingdoms, this is a message to all who would torture, kill, steal, and inflict any pain on the innocent. We are Venom, and as of this moment, none of you are safe, Venom said into the camera before directing it to the last worker. Without hesitation, Venom lifted his foot and stomped it down onto the worker's head, crushing it into a bloody paste. He then turned the camera back towards himself before biting it in half. With that, Venom launched another web and swung away, knowing his message has been sent, and that now people will know of his existence. They will know the lethal protector is out there, and he's coming for you. Venom, the lethal protector. Hero or villain? The newest headline across the Four Kingdoms the day after Venom's appearance at the Schnee Dust Company's party and the brutal execution of the SDC workers was Venom. Hero or villain? Venom's sudden appearance had caused pandemonium throughout the city of Atlas, with everyone fearing they might be its next target. Those connected to the SDC, especially aware of Jacques Schnee's treatment of his Faunus workers, were the most terrified. Many planned to cut ties with Jacques to save themselves. While nearly everyone agreed that Venom was a terrifying figure, opinions were divided on whether Venom was a hero for exposing the SDC and Jacques's true nature, or a villain for brutally killing the workers. Venom's presence wasn't just stirring up conversations in Mantle and Atlas. Across Remnant, people were intrigued by this new figure. Mistral. On the edge of the continent of Anima, home to the kingdom of Mistral, members of the Branwen tribe watched a recording of Venom's appearance and the execution of the SDC workers. Some of the bandits grimaced at Venom's violent actions. Meanwhile, the leader of the tribe, Raven Branwen, sat in her tent, frowning as she watched the video. While others wondered about Venom's origins and nature, Raven speculated whether Venom was a new type of grim created by Salem or a result of Ashbin's desperation. She considered Venom a potential threat, but also a potential asset if handled correctly. Could this thing be a threat to us? Asked Vernal, a member of the tribe whom Raven trusted. Raven glanced at her for a moment before returning her focus to the video. Possibly, she replied. For now, we'll watch and wait to see what else they do and will take advantage of everyone's attention being on them. Vernal nodded and left the tent to inform the others, while Raven contemplated a trip to Solita's, thinking it might help ease tensions in Anima and provide opportunities for their tribe. Watching the video feed, Raven couldn't help but smirk as it shifted to a live news report showing Jacques Schnee being questioned. Fun isn't something one considers when looking at these recent events, but this does put a smile on my face. She may have been a bandit and a killer, but even Raven had standards. Patch, can you believe it, sis? There's a real superhero out there, exclaimed 10-year-old Ruby Rose, her face beaming with excitement as she ran around her in Yang's room. Right, a eh? hero Ruby, replied 12-year-old Yang, offering a strained smile. She didn't exactly consider Venom a hero after witnessing his brutal actions against the workers. Yang was relieved that she and their dad, Taiyang Xiaolong, had shielded Ruby from the worst of Venom's deeds. But Ruby had still heard Venom's message, leading her to see him as a protector of the innocent, both human and Faunus. Why aren't you excited? Now there's someone out there helping people, including Faunus. Isn't that good? Ruby asked earnestly. I guess, but we still don't really know anything about this Venom guy. For all we know, it could just be a trick, Young replied. Nope. You'll see that Venom is a hero, Ruby asserted confidently. Right? Young muttered as she left their room and found their dad standing just outside, wearing a worried expression. Taeyong shared Yang's concerns about Ruby idolizing Venom, but he didn't want to shatter her belief in having a hero to look up to. He hoped she would learn the truth when she was older. Dad, do you think we should tell Ruby what really happened? Yang asked it. No, let her enjoy the idea of having a hero to look up to. She'll learn when she's older, I hope, Taeyong replied, muttering the last part to himself. Perhaps he could enlist Crow to talk to Ruby and help her see Venom differently. Vale. Crow Branwen sneezed as he sat in a bar in Vale. Wiping his nose, he sipped his drink and glanced up at a television showing Venom's attack. Like his sister, Crow wondered if this was a new type of grim created by Salem, only to immediately dismiss the idea. 
If it were a Grim, why would it attack Atlas and only kill a few people? And how could it talk? Unless it is a Grim, but someone's wearing it, Crow thought, pondering if it was possible for a Grim to possess people or if the person inside it was in control of themselves. Whatever Venom is, Crow wasn't going to interfere in his business unless Ashpin sent him to investigate. So, for now, Crow would just be wary if he came across Venom but wouldn't attack, uncertain of his true power. On a more personal level, Crow couldn't deny he took a dark joy in how Venom was thwarting someone like Jacques Schnee. I'm going to enjoy watching you bury yourself, Crow thought, smirking as he watched Jacques himself appear and began making excuses that only dug him into an even deeper hole. Beacon Academy Ashpin sat in his office, reviewing videos and photos of Venom on his scroll. Venom's appearance and brutal nature suggested he might be a Grim, but unlike a Grim, Venom didn't kill anyone besides the SDC workers before leaving. Do you think this is a new plan from Salem? asked Glinda Goodwitch, standing beside Ashpin, concerned. No, while Venom looks like a Grim, I doubt he is connected to Salem. This is too rash and open for Salem to be involved. I honestly don't know who or what Venom is. Just that he's not someone to be trifled with, Ashpin replied. What should we do? Goodwitch asked, believing someone like Venom couldn't be allowed to roam freely and kill anyone who got in his way. For now, nothing. We don't know where Venom is, who or what he is, or his motives. All we can do is watch and wait, replied Ashpin, knowing there wasn't anything they could do at the moment. However, he had one troubling idea of who Venom could be, an idea that worried him greatly. What if Venom was sent by the Brother Gods? showing that Ashbin was out of time in trying to unite Remnant, and they had sent Venom. But was he sent to accomplish what Ashbin had failed to do? Or was Venom the one who would bring about their end? I hope that I'm wrong. Otherwise, this will be my final life, Ashbin thought. Land of Darkness. Meanwhile, within the Land of Darkness, Evernight Castle sat, the base of Salem and her inner circle, consisting of Arthur Watts, Tyrion Kalos, and Hazel Reynard. Even they had learned of Venom's attack, and were both surprised and intrigued by him. Tyrion laughed madly at how Venom murdered the SDC workers. Ha 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 ha. I like his style. Nothing but blood, death, and chaos. Yes. My lady, if you don't mind my asking, is this a new grim you have created? Arthur asked Salem, who watched Venom's image with intrigue. No, this is not one of my creations, Arthur. Though it's most interesting. I can feel that this Venom is grim-like, but he's not a grim himself. He's something else. Salem commented, intrigued by what Venom was. Was he like her, having fallen into a pool of grim and become this creature? If so, how did the person survive? Salem was immortal and couldn't die, so how could this person have survived? Should we take him out? Hazel asked, frowning at Venom's casual slaughter and the loss of life. No, for now, let us wait and see what else Venom does. But if we get the chance, we will capture Venom and see what he is. Who knows? Perhaps he could prove to be a possible recruit, said Salem, thinking the last part with a smirk. And perhaps, something more. If this Venom was like her and survived falling into a pool of grim, then he would be so much more than a disposable pawn or killer. After all, once she finally kills Ozma permanently, along with his allies, she will collect the four relics and absorb the power of the maidens, allowing her to rule over all of Remnant as queen. And every queen needs a king, Salem thought looking at the image of Venom. Meanwhile, in another part of the castle, Salem's newest protege slash pawn, Cinderfall, watched Venom's attack, intrigued by the power displayed. That power, with it and the power of the maidens, I'd be unstoppable, Cinder thought, her eyes gleaming with ambition. Unknown location. On an uninhabited island off the coast of the continent of Sanus resided a massive complex belonging to the now-defunct Merlot Industries and home to the believed to be deceased Dr. Merlot. Yes, yes, yes. This is exactly as I have said, the key to the next stage of evolution in Remnant. Merlot thought, grinning wickedly as he looked over various images of Venom's attack. Merlot was no fool. He knew exactly what Venom was, a hybrid between a human and a grim. Taking the raw strength and power of a Grim with the human mind in control, creating the perfect Grim, whereas the rest were flawed and incomplete. I must capture this Venom and study it. With the knowledge I gained from it, I will finally be able to complete my research and create the perfect hybrid, muttered Merlot, staring intently at Venom's image, swearing he would find this creature and capture it to complete his research. Menagerie. See, Gyra, this is proof enough for you. If the Faunus wish to be seen as equal, we need to show the humans we won't remain passive and will fight back. 
Sienna Khan argued with Gyra Belladonna, the high leader of the White Fang. After Venom's attack and the subsequent confession of mistreatment of Faunus workers by the SDC employees, the entire White Fang was in an uproar, even more so than when Jacques Schnee labeled them terrorists after the mine incident. Though this resulted in their numbers growing, with many Faunus angered by the treatment of their kin and eager to take action. Even Gyra, who typically preferred a more peaceful approach to equality, harbored a desire to confront Jacques Schnee. However, he recognized that violence wouldn't solve anything and would only lead to more violence. Moreover, Venom's actions would likely lead to Jacques' downfall eventually. However, many Faunus weren't satisfied with that outcome and wanted Jacques' head. Currently, Gyra was having a meeting with several high-ranking members of the White Fang to discuss their next steps. And what would you have us do, Sienna? March up to Atlas and attack the SDC? That would only make them martyrs, especially those who had nothing to do with this. No, I won't risk undoing everything we've worked for. Instead, we'll send a small team to Mantle to find the Faunus there and bring them somewhere safe, Gyra said, opting for a more cautious approach. And who would you send? Sienna questioned annoyed that he wasn't willing to take more direct action. I'll go, someone said. Gyra saw that the one who spoke was Adam Taurus, making him frown. Adam, are you sure? He asked, aware of Adam's troubled history in Atlas, particularly with the SDC. Yes, if it means ensuring no fauna suffer under someone like Jacques Schnee, I'll do it. Besides, those who join me can help set up a place where the faunus we gather can rest and eat before we move them out of Solitas, Adam replied. Gyra nodded in agreement recognizing the value in providing a safe haven for the faunus they would rescue from Mantle. Your thoughts, Sienna? He asked, turning to Sienna, knowing that despite their differences, she truly cared for the faunus and sought to improve their situation, even if her methods were too violent for his taste. He even considered naming her his successor as High Leader of the White Fang, as he planned to step down soon to become the full-time chieftain of Menagerie. Will you be able to control yourself? Sienna asked Adam acknowledging his temper when it came to the SDC. As long as I stay focused on my goal, yes, Adam answered. Very well, Adam. You and ten others will go to Mantle to set up a sanctuary for Faunus in need, Gyra said, with Adam nodding and giving a short bow before leaving the meeting. However, none of them noticed Adam's smirk or his eyes glowing white as he departed. They also failed to notice that Adam hadn't disclosed his exact goal. I hope you're ready, Shni, because your suffering has only just begun Adam thought, vowing to make Jacques Schnee pay for his actions. Chieftain's home. Meanwhile, within the chieftain's home, Gyra's wife and daughter, Callie and Blake, along with Blake's friend and fellow White Fang member, Ilya, watched Venom's attack. It shocked and angered them to see what their fellow Faunus had endured. Ilya, in particular, was affected given her parents' involvement in a mining accident in Mantle. However, while the brutality of Venom's actions shocked and frightened them, they understood his motivations which only strengthened their resolve to improve the lives of their kin. Haven Academy Leonardo Lionheart, headmaster of Haven Academy, couldn't deny the fear and panic he felt as he watched the video of Venom's attack. This has to be a grim, he thought. Feeling compelled to contact Oshpin, he feared that this grim might target those allied with Oshpin, including himself. Unless, unless this is Salem's newest grim, and she's sending it after anyone siding with Oshpin, Lionheart considered terrified at the prospect of facing a grim under Salem's direct control. He realized that siding with Ashbin would likely mean his inevitable death, as Salem alone posed an impossible threat to defeat, let alone with this new creature at her command. Mistral. Down in the city of Mistral, Sun Wukong and his friend Neptune Vasilias watched in a mix of fear and amazement at Venom's appearance and attack. They were both terrified by his brutality, but also impressed by his strength and skill. Man, He's got some sweet moves, Sun said, watching Venom take out the Elysian soldiers and knights. Yeah, we'd have to train really hard if we want to be that good, said Neptune before the two grinned at each other, hoping they would become that strong when they were older. Shade Academy Within Shade Academy and Vacuo, Headmaster Theodore frowned as he watched the video of Venom's attack. He was sure Ashbin, and possibly Salem, had already seen it as well, and were likely wondering who or what Venom was. Theodore was also pondering that question along with wondering if there were more beings like Venom. If one could cause such havoc, what could two, three, or a dozen accomplish? I'll have to see about changing the curriculum and increasing the training for my students, Theodore thought, recognizing that Venom's appearance would likely pave the way for others like him. He resolved to ensure his hunters would be ready for whatever challenges lay ahead. Argus. 
12-year-old Pierre Nikos could only watch the video of Venom killing the SDC workers with pity and sadness. She felt for the faunus who suffered in dust mines, and even for the workers who took enjoyment in the suffering of others, despite their gruesome deaths. Unlike most kids her age, Pira wasn't as horrified at the idea of killing, having learned that some individuals are beyond redemption. However, she believed there could have been a less violent and brutal way of dealing with the workers, though she accepted that she wouldn't shed any tears over their deaths. Hopefully, Venom will change his ways, Pira thought, believing that Venom could become a hero capable of doing good in the world. But she hoped he would achieve this without resorting to killing everyone he encountered. Suddenly, Pira turned around when her door opened, and she smiled when she saw her father standing there. What are you watching, Pira? he asked, with Pira showing him the video of Venom's attack, making him frown, unsure if she should be seeing something like that at her age. Do you think he was right? Killing those workers like he did, even after they already confessed their crimes? Pira asked as her father sat down beside her, placing a hand on her shoulder. Do I believe they deserve to die? Yes, after the crimes they committed, taking pleasure in hurting and torturing Faunus, they deserved it. But did they deserve to die like that? I don't believe so. However, I also believe such an act was necessary to show people like those workers that there is someone out there who won't hesitate to inflict such pain on them. Sometimes, Pira, drastic actions must be taken to ensure you get results, he explained, with Pira frowning but nodding in understanding. Do you think Venom will change his ways to be better? asked Pira. Perhaps. Anyone can change in the future, he replied. Pira smiled at that before looking back at the video. Ark Household. 13-year-old Jean Ark had been horrified when she first watched Venom kill the SDC workers. Though she could still understand the reasons behind it and felt bad for the suffering of the Faunus workers, she felt it was too extreme, believing there could have been an easier way to solve it. However, even so, Jean watched the video of the attack again thinking of all the faunus who suffered in the dust mines and all those who suffered in the kingdoms. It made Jean swear that one day, she would become a huntress to help people, showing that there would be someone who would assist humans, faunus, and anyone else in need of help. Vali. In another part of Vale, 12-year-old Lyran and 12-year-old Nora Valkyrie, his best friend, watched in fear, amazement, and respect as Venom attacked the Shni party and forced the workers to confess their mistreatment of faunus in the dust mines. Remembering the attack on their village, Rin couldn't help but feel respect for Venom, appreciating that there was finally a protector willing to do what was necessary to obtain justice for people. It made Rin more determined than ever to become a huntsman and ensure that what happened with Kuro Yuri didn't occur elsewhere. Rain, We should get costumes to fight crime, Nora said excitedly, wanting to dress up and fight crime now. We're not doing that, Nora, stated Rin, knowing they weren't just kids, but also training to be huntsmen and huntresses. Warehouse. Roman Torchwick whistled in amazement as he and his right hand, Neo, watched Venom's attack. Gotta say, whoever this guy is, or whatever he is, certainly knows how to make an impression, Torchwick commented, with Neo nodding in agreement. Along with knowing how to really screw someone over, Neo said with her sign. Indeed they do. What I wouldn't give to see those Schnee's faces right now, said Torchwick, smirking, knowing that with the chaos Venom had caused, it would be the perfect time for them to take advantage of all eyes being on him. Mantle, Robin Hill, and her happy huntresses, as people have started calling them, looked at their scrolls, watching as Venom forced the SDC workers to confess their mistreatment of the Faunus before executing them. Robin, what should we do if Venom comes here? asked Fiona Time, the sole Faunus in the group, while looking at Robin, worried about Venom targeting Mantle's residence. Then we'll put the freak down before he can touch the citizens of Mantle. Joanna Greenleaf answered, not afraid to face Venom if it meant protecting Mantle. The only ones who'd be put in the ground would be us if we tried engaging Venom, said Robin, watching how Venom fought and noticing his unusual reactions to attacks, possibly a semblance warning him of danger, or something else, not to mention his strength and those webs he can create. So, we just sit back and let him kill people? May Marigold said, angry at the idea of doing nothing if Venom attacked Mantle. That's not what I said just that attacking him would end in our deaths. If Venom does come here, and we do encounter him, it will be under peaceful terms rather than attacking. But only if we manage to find him, and if he does come to Mantle. Besides, from his message, I'm pretty sure anyone he targets has it coming, Robin said, while pocketing her scroll. While Venom might be an unknown, it seems like he's not a complete monster, just a monster that other monsters should fear. Atlas Academy. Just what are you? wondered James Ironwood. Headmaster of Atlas Academy and General of the Elysian Military, 
as he examined the video footage of Venom's attack with a frown. On a personal level, Ironwood could agree with Venom's attack against Jacques and finally exposing some of the corrupt nature of the SDC, with it also giving him a legal excuse to begin investigating Jacques and hopefully put him away, given Ironwood couldn't stand Jacques Schnee or his selfish greed. But as a military leader, Ironwood also knew he needed to see Venom as a potential threat to Atlas, especially with how easily he snuck into Atlas without an alarm going off. And while his message showed he was targeting criminals or anyone who hurts the innocent, Ironwood couldn't take the chance or risk of someone taking the law into their own hands in Atlas, especially if Venom decides to branch out in who he targets. I'll have my men be on the lookout for Venom, with orders to detain and capture, Ironwood thought. Wanting to find out who or what Venom was along with ensuring the panic he caused can be ended before it draws in the grim. Schnee Manor. Willow Schnee sipped her wine as she sat in the garden, the only location she really liked to be anymore in her home. She, like the rest of Remnant, had been shocked at Venom's appearance, but her shock hadn't lasted. She knew it was likely only a matter of time before her husband's actions finally came back to haunt him. The only surprise was the form it took. When the initial shock wore off, though, Willow went back to being uncaring, as she had been for the past three years since Weiss's tenth birthday, when Jacques finally revealed he only married her for her family name. She always suspected that was the reason, but for Jacques to confirm it, it shattered what little hope she had left for a happy life. So, Willow turned to alcoholism to cope with being married to a cold and uncaring man. Willow lost hope of a better life, or trying to stop Jacques' actions with her father's company, turning a completely blind and indifferent eye to it all. It even led her to neglect her own children, with Winter having already left to join the Elysian military. Though that didn't mean she didn't care about her children. She did. Given the hidden camera she had set up in every room out of fear and paranoia of Jacques one day, doing something to her or her children. Now with Venom's appearance, Willow felt foolish for feeling a spark of hope at Jacques finally being torn down. But she did, and hoped Jacques got what he deserved. Mother. Blinking, Willow looked and saw her 13-year-old daughter, Weiss, standing by the door. Yes, Weiss, Willow said, turning back to look forward. Is, is Venom going to come after us? Weiss asked, terrified at the thought of Venom coming after her, of him crashing into her room and biting her head off, ripping her throat open, or even just tearing her in half. After seeing what Venom did to the workers, Weiss had been horrified at the gruesome and painful deaths, but she also felt pity. While she may be angry at the White Fang for the attacks against her family and the SDC, Weiss knew after the confessions from the workers, her father has had this coming for years. But while Weiss could understand Venom's actions, he was still attacking her family's company and tarnishing her family's legacy even more than her father has. On one hand, she wanted to accept Venom's attack was warranted, but on the other, it was her family he was attacking. Add in her building fear of Venom coming after her, as well, Weiss simply wanted some reassurance that she was safe. Even if it came from her increasingly uncaring mother. No, Weiss, I doubt Venom will come after you, said Willow, with Weiss nodding slowly before turning to go back inside but stopped and looked at her mother. Venom, he's going to go after father, won't he? Weiss asked with Willow glancing at her daughter. Possibly yes, Willow replied, only to be surprised when she saw Weiss's eyes harden. Good, said Weiss before going inside to resume her training. Time skipped two days. Jacques Schnee gritted his teeth in anger as he sat in the most recent board of directors meeting, having lost track of how many he's had to attend since that damn Venom showed up. Ever since that freak showed up and attacked the party he held, everything has been going downhill. Not only were all the mines under the SDC being investigated for mistreatment of the animals, who should be grateful he even found a use for them, but shareholders were also starting to pull out of funding the SDC, along with various clients looking elsewhere to purchase dust. The worst, though, had to be that his position as CEO was in jeopardy, and Jacques refused to lose control of the company after everything he went through to gain control. To make matters worse, they're now thinking of offering the position to either Winter, given her ties to the Elysian military or having his father-in-law, Nicholas Schnee, come back to take over. We've contacted both Winter and Nicholas, asking them to take up the position as CEO. Though Winter has refused, wanting to focus on her military career, said one of the board members. And what about Willow, Weiss, or Whitley? They are just as capable of taking over the company in my stead, Jacques said. Knowing if it was any of those three, then he'd be able to still run the company through them. Only for the idea to be shot down when the board members shook their heads. No. Weiss is far too young to take over, with Whitley being even younger than Weiss. While Willow is not suited to run the company in her current state, 
Besides, Nicholas has already agreed to return on two conditions, said another member. And what conditions are those? Jacques demanded, hoping he could use them to his advantage and keep his position. The first is that he'll be CEO only until his daughter cleans up her act and he deems her ready to take over. And the second is that you are out of the company, Jacques, permanently, said the second board member. What? shouted Jacques, standing up in anger at what he just heard. Given what he's heard, Nicholas realizes he made a mistake in naming you as his successor, and now wants you out of the SDC, said another member. A mistake? I'm the one who built this company to what it is. You can't just kick me out, Jacques shouted, glaring at the board, with the members not looking the least bit intimidated by his anger, knowing it was already unanimously decided to kick Jacques out. Given the corrupt members that knew of Jacques' illegal activities and mistreatment of Faunus workers were hoping to not be dragged down with him, or worse, have Venom come after them next. It's already decided. You're out, Jacques, said the first member, angered further by this. Jacques stormed out in a rage before pulling out his scroll, contacting one of the few scientists he had that was still loyal to him, all while swearing that he'll make those upstart windbags pay for thinking they can kick him out of his company. And then your next Venom. Jacques thought, swearing they'll all pay. Later SDC Laboratory. Mr. Schnee, please. The performance enhancers aren't ready. The data just doesn't justify this test, said a scientist, watching as Jacques grabbed a glass tube filled with a clear white liquid with the label CX.0009 on the tube. Jacques ignored the scientist as he inserted the tube into a machine before typing on a computer, getting ready for the experiment. This was one of the SDC's private experiments a super soldier serum designed to enhance the subject's physical abilities to that of a professional huntsman and beyond even that. Having taken inspiration from the serum used on Captain Arcadia before his disappearance at the end of the Great War, it was created in the hopes of making it so anyone could fight the Grim, eventually rendering hunters obsolete. Of course, the serum wasn't yet completed, still being in the prototype stages. They couldn't even use the serum that was used on Captain Arcadia as a reference, since all of the research on it was destroyed while those who worked on it were killed when an enemy spy tried to prevent the experiment from happening. But Jacques was desperate, since the serum wouldn't only earn him recognition and protect his position as CEO, but also allow him to take care of Venom himself. Now, I'm telling you for the last time, we can't do this, the scientist said, knowing if Jacques used the serum on himself, there's a chance that he'll either die or go insane, like the previous test subjects have. Don't be a coward. Risks are part of laboratory science, Jacques retorted, going over to another console, causing a metal tray to slide out of a large glass chamber. Let me reschedule, with a proper medical staff and a volunteer. Just give me two weeks, the scientist pleaded. Two weeks. In two weeks, I'll no longer be the CEO, and the SDC will be dead without me. Now I'm doing things myself. Get me the prochlorperazine, Jacques said, taking off his jacket, clip-on tie, and shirt. For what? asked the scientist while getting the item. It begins catalyzation when the vapor hits the bloodstream, said Jacques, taking the prochlorperazine and looking at the bottle, imagining the revenge he'll take with his new abilities. Drinking the liquid, Jacques threw the bottle on the ground before getting on the metal tray, flinching slightly when the metal restraints were locked around his body. The scientist went over to the console, causing the tray to slide into the chamber and raise itself up, with Jacques nodding at him to begin the experiment. Reluctantly, the scientist started the procedure, causing the serum to drain from the tube and enter the chamber in a white vapor form. Jacques inhaled the vapor, soon being covered in it, while the scientist looked at several monitors showing his vitals, getting worried when his heart skyrocketed. Mr. Schnee, the scientist said, gasping when the vapor cleared, showing Jacques seizing in his restraints. Mr. Schnee, shouted the scientist, running over and beginning to drain the chamber of the vapor panicking when he saw Jacques' eyes had rolled into the back of his head. Oh my God, muttered the scientist when Jacques suddenly went completely still, with the heart monitor flatlining. Oh my God, Mr. Schnee, the scientist said, opening the chamber and running inside. Mr. Schnee, said the scientist, opening the restraints and beginning chest compressions, hoping he could revive him. Looking, the scientist was relieved when he saw the heart monitor showing a pulse again. Though unseen to him, Jacques' eyes snapped open. Turning back to Jacques, the scientist gasped when Jacques wrapped his hand around his throat with a vicious snarl on his face. Back to formula, Jacques growled before throwing the scientist straight through the glass chamber and into a metal rack. Jumping onto the edge, Jacques hissed with a wicked grin on his face before jumping forward, 
ready to make everyone who crossed him suffer. So, what did you think, good? Yep, a lot of people are divided on whether Venom is a hero, a villain, or something else entirely. Along with a few hints at what's to come in characters that will appear later on, with it all building up to Jacques Schnee in a very familiar scene and will soon make his own debut. Now then, we also have an omake for the Elemental Nation side of things in regards to Naruto's death. Omake. Shattered Prophecy. Nearly three months have passed since Naruto's death during the retrieval mission, with the revelation having a great impact on all those who knew the Whiskered Blonde. Within Konoha, the ones who took it the hardest were Tsunade, Kakashi, and the Rookies. With Shikamaru taking it the hardest, since he had been the team leader, believing had he gotten more members, this wouldn't have happened. Iruka had been saddened to learn of his former student's death, but made sure to comfort Konoamaru and his friends, with Konoamaru acting like he had when his grandfather died and isolated himself. The Ichiraku family had also been depressed at their favorite customer's death. Even worse was how the villagers had even started badmouthing Naruto. This led them to pack their stand and move to the Land of Waves, remembering how Naruto talked about it, from his mission and the people there, knowing the citizens of Wave would care about Naruto, for everything he did. Training Ground 7. Smash. Again, screamed a panting Sakura as she smashed yet another boulder thrown at her by Tsunade, with the mentioned Sanin, her apprentice-slash-assistant Shizun, and her sensei, Kakashi, standing by her side, all three of them helping the Pinkhead train. It all started after learning of Naruto's death, with Sakura blaming herself for being literally worthless enough to not be able to help either of her teammates in any way, and now one of them had died, while the other was in Orochimaru's grasp. It was at that point in her lowest that she had enough of being so weak. Thus she went to her sensei, as well as Tsunade, and pleaded to them to train her, so she can go beyond her limits, all to be able to redeem herself and honor Naruto's memory by stopping Sasuke before it was too late, and bring down both Orochimaru and the Akatsuki. While initially surprised, they quickly agreed as well, wanting to be able to make up for their mistakes and how they couldn't help Naruto enough. And thus they all were training. Hyuga Clan Compound, Training Room, Haya. Hinata snapped back as she threw herself fiercely against Niji and Hanabi, who were being pushed back despite being more skilled than the formerly shy girl. All thanks to her renewed determination after recovering from Naruto's death. It truly hurt her, even now, but she knew that her crush wouldn't want her, nor anyone else to sit down and drown in despair, while doing nothing. Like she had done for so long, and instead, she decided to honor his memory by accomplishing their dreams together with her not only becoming a strong yet kind head of her clan, but also the next Hokage, all to change her family's ways. Meanwhile, Hayashi Hyuga and the elders were watching seriously, yet there was a hint of surprise and pride in their stares, as they saw just how much Hinata was improving, alongside her sister and cousin, showing that, indeed, the next generation of the Hyuga would lead the clan to greater heights than before. Root HQ, beneath Kanoha, Lord Danzo, we have received word that the bounties of Sasuke Uchiha, Kabuto Yakushi, and Orochimaru have been upgraded, with the new rewards for them, especially if their heads are brought. Though Tsunade is unfortunately insistent that the Uchiha is to be brought back alive, as to honor the Kyubi Jinchuriki's memory, said one of the rude Unbu, kneeling down before the shadow of Kanoha, who nodded stiffly. Good, though Tsunade's personal feelings are keeping her from putting a kill on site order. We can still use this to our advantage. Now go back to your post. Taka, and tell the others to increase the training of all members to prepare for the upcoming war, Danzo ordered, with his recruit agreeing before retiring and leaving him to think about the future events and how the loss of the Kyubi Jinchuriki could lead to a possible fourth Shinobi World War, especially once the other villages got word about it, which is why they had to prepare for the worst-case scenario. Suna, in Sunagakir, the recently instated Godame Kazakage, Gara, set down the newest edition of the bingo book, now listing Sasuke Uchiha with a kill on site order. Glaring at the image of the Uchiha, Gara soon turned away and looked out over his village. Naruto Uzumaki, I'm sorry I wasn't able to save you, like you saved me, but I swear, I will honor your memory and become a Kage worthy of your dream. Gara mentally swore, wanting to honor his first friend's memory. Land of Sound, Jiraiya shouted as he slammed a Rasengan into another Odo ninja's head, killing them, before grabbing another by their neck. Where's Orochimaru? Jiraiya demanded slamming them against the wall with a dark glare. Ever since he learned about Naruto's death, Jiraiya had been hunting down every single one of Orochimaru's subordinates and bases, not stopping until he got his hands on that snake, letting out all the negative emotions he usually keeps buried, wanting to avenge his godson's death, 
along with being filled with self-loathing at once again letting another person he cares about die. Now he's not going to stop until he finds Orochimaru and does what he should have done years ago, and finally put the snake in the ground. Amage Cure Meanwhile, within Amage Cure, a meeting was being held in one of the Akatsuki's bases about the death of the Kyubi Jinchuriki. Itachi, what do you have to say for yourself? Pain demanded, glaring at the Uchiha, holding him responsible, given it was his brother that killed the Kyubi Jinchuriki and potentially ruined their plans. I have nothing to say, Pain-sama. I did not think Sasuke would actually kill Naruto, said Itachi. And yet he has, putting our plans in jeopardy with the Kyubi gone. It's for this reason, Itachi, you are now responsible for finishing what you started and end the Uchiha clan. Because if you don't, I will have Kakuzu and Haydn hunt him down and collect the bounties on your brother's head from Kanoha and Suna, Payne said, with Itachi lowering his head, filled with shame, blaming himself for this for having pushed Sasuke too far in his goal to kill him. Now, either Itachi had to kill his little brother, or have him be hunted and slaughtered by Haydn and Kakuzu. Very well, said Itachi. Good. All of you are dismissed, until further notice, Payne ordered, as all the members, besides Conan, Zetsu, and Payne himself, vanished. Once all the members had left, Madara stepped out of the shadows. Well, this is a fine mess, isn't it? Madara stated, annoyed with this development, but knew he could still salvage the Moon's Eye plan, even with the Uzumaki boy's death. What can we do? Without the QB, the ceiling cannot be completed, said Payne. We don't need the QB just its chakra, which we can get by reviving the gold and silver brothers. Along with the rumors I've heard of a boy in the fire temple, possessing a fragment of the fox's chakra, as well, while not perfect, it's the best we can do at the moment. Also, I would like you to call off the hit you have on Sasuke, since I have plans for the boy, said Madara, knowing those three should have enough of the Kyubi's chakra to be a good substitute. Very well. But may I ask why Sasuke should be left alive? Pain asked, not liking how he was essentially forced to spare the boy, after having just ordered his death. Let's just say, with the right push, the boy can become a worthy successor, as the second coming of Madara Uchiha, Madara, said, knowing that with his potential, Sasuke will be invaluable to the Eye of the Moon plan when the time comes to replace Itachi. Conan, make sure that there's an anonymous increase in the bounties for the heads of Orochimaru, Kabuto, and Sasuke, as their actions have dealt us too much of a blow to simply pass by, even if Madara wants to say otherwise, Payne ordered, the moment Madara was gone, and they couldn't detect either his or Zetsu's presences, with the blue-haired woman nodding at the order. Very well, Nagato. In fact, I'll even see if Sasori and Daidara are interested in tying up those loose ends, she suggested. Knowing that those two members had quite the grudge with Orochimaru, as well as his accomplices to a certain extent, and would be more than willing to go and deal with them if given enough incentive. Very good, Conan. Just make sure that no one else, aside from those two, learns of this, warned Nagato, as they got ready to start fixing the mistakes around them. With Orochimaru. Meanwhile, Orochimaru sat within Odogekure, panicking over what has happened, not thinking the QB brat's death would lead to this. Not only was his bounty nearly tripled from Kanoha, leading to more people hunting him down, now he had to deal with an enraged Jiraiya coming after him as well, something the snake Sanin was secretly terrified of. Knowing for Jiraiya to be truly mad, he wouldn't stop until he, Orochimaru, was really dead. Even worse, the Akatsuki would likely be after him, as well. While Orochimaru was working on making sure no one could find him, while Kabuto was having his own thoughts of cutting his losses, not wanting to be dragged down with the Sanin when he's inevitably found, either by Kanoha or the Akatsuki. All the while, Sasuke has merely kept to himself and trained for when he'll finally confront Itachi wanting to make sure he was strong enough to kill his brother and so Naruto's death wouldn't be in vain. Thank you for watching. If you liked our video, please hit the like button, subscribe for updates, and follow our Twitter, info in description. Credits go to the story's author, with details below. Don't miss out on our other content, click on the suggested video for more stories and adventures. We appreciate your support and look forward to seeing you in our next video.